Good morning. Our program will begin in five minutes. Please take your seats and silence your cell phones.
every company needs to be talking about their space strategy over the course of the next decade. Um, space isn't a separate sphere of activity as it's often seen to be, but space is, you know, in our everyday lives. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day three of Satellite 2023. My name is Jeffrey Hill, Executive Chairman of Satellite. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'd also like to thank our opening general session sponsor today, Viasat, for supporting this important discussion. Also, thank you to Viasat CEO Mark Dankberg for taking part in yesterday's opening general session. We appreciate the support Mark and his team at Viasat over the, over the previous year, so thank you so much. The video you just saw details a new editorial project that I'm personally very passionate about, the Future Space Economy monthly webcast series, a platform we conceived as a spin-off of our popular podcast on orbit. The, uh, the mission of the webcast is to educate the general public, or uh, the space curious, as uh, we've been saying on the show, about what our modern interconnected global economy would look like with a layer of space infrastructure and operations. So medical research, energy, manufacturing, banking, tourism industries are actively investing in access to space. And today's opening general session will outline how leaders in the space technology community will build a safe and secure foundation to support this new economy. Before we start the panel, we're going to hear about how we're going to connect today's economy on Earth. And we have the privilege of bringing on one of the most prominent leaders of the satellite operator community, SES CEO Steve Collar, on stage for opening remarks and a peek into the company's plans for future global connectivity. Steve was appointed CEO of SES after having previously led both O3B networks and SES networks. As CEO of O3B networks, Steve guided the company through the successful launch of its state-of-the-art non-geostationary satellite constellation. And in 2015, the company officially became the fastest growing satellite operator in history. And SES with Steve at the helm continues to drive innovation and connectivity as one of the world's most influential tech companies. So please join me in welcoming this morning's featured keynote speaker, SES CEO, Steve Collar. Good morning. How are we all? First one of the morning, probably a late night last night. So I'm gonna get you all involved in the conversation this morning by asking you a question. And the question is, why are we here? And I don't mean that in a sort of existential, why do we exist kind of way. I mean, why are we here? Why are you here at a satellite show drinking far too much bad coffee when you could be on spring break? And I'm gonna guess that the answer is that you're passionate about space and that you're inspired by the ability for you to impact people's lives just by doing your job, and inspired and challenged by the idea of delivering and deploying services from one of the most hostile environments uh, that you can imagine. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you that you're right, that you're right to be here, and that you're right to be inspired, and you're right to be excited about this industry. I joined the satellite industry 30 years ago completely by accident, and I've never left. And I think if we compare the opportunities that we have today to impact people's lives positively, if we compare the technologies that we have available to do that, and if we um, think about the strategic importance of space, our domain where we all um, live and deploy services from, the importance of space any, from protecting our nations, protecting our countries through to getting us around through to looking after our planet and making sure that future generations can live as prosperously as we can. You're 100% right to be in this room drinking the bad coffee. Okay, and so what I'm gonna talk about this morning is why I feel that way, why I feel that 30 years on the opportunities, there's so much more ahead of us than there is behind us and the opportunities in front of us are so great. But the challenges are great as well. The, 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 the sort of the problems that we have to solve together are great. And so sovereign networks, space has never been more important to governments to deliver communications, to keep people safe. We have to continuously 
prepare for conflict, but at the same time underpin peace and use satellites and satellite networks to protect and defend and support. The Internet of Things, billions and billions of devices that are generating data. That data needs to get somewhere to be sort of analyzed, assessed, and then reported back, those insights being used. And satellite is becoming an increasingly important part of global network of connected devices. Earth observation, persistent observation of the planet, persistent observation using multiple different types of um, technologies, optical, infrared, and again, getting that data to somewhere where it can be used, assessed, uh, analyzed, and those places that are increasingly in the cloud, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about cloud in a second. Universal connectivity, if COVID had hit 30 years ago, I think the, the impact on the world would have been incredibly significant. It would have shut down economies in a much more profound way than actually happened. And what COVID showed us was the importance of being connected, the importance of continuing to be educated, continuing to run businesses and be in touch, and yet there's still billions of people on the planet who are not affordably connected uh, to the world's platform, and that's something that we can address and that we can be helpful with. And the need to be connected wherever you are. I don't need to speak to this. Your expectation is that you're going to get service wherever you are, and that's the same expectation that everybody has in all walks of life, and satellite is a key enabler there. And cloud at the edge, so you know, the future of, of our networks rely on having storage and compute very, very close to the edge of the network. And one of the incredible superpowers of satellite is reach, that we can reach the edge of the network as easily as we can reach the center of the network. So large challenges, but also fantastic solutions. We are massively relevant in a way that we probably weren't 30 years ago, 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, this room and our industry is massively relevant in solving some of the world's largest challenges. And we can think about how we can do that either as individual companies or as an industry. And one of the most successful industries in terms of standardization and leveraging investment across the industry is 3GPP, GSM. The standardization that took place meant that everybody got to participate in, in the ecosystem. And I don't think that this is a model for us in space, but we can definitely learn lessons. How do we increase the scale without necessarily ending up with one network and one operator? And we can do that by being intelligent about the way we build our systems and all trying to build them with the same ideas in mind. And so when we started thinking about O3BM Power, that's exactly where we were. It's how do we build O3BM Power from the start to be sort of cloud native and at cloud scale? That means integrating our gateways directly into the cloud so our customers are always one hop away, operating the system in the cloud so we don't need hundreds or thousands of people to go manage the system. A cloud native architecture which enables the system to be driven from and make maximum use of the cloud. Digital, flexible, and interoperable. So standards drive interoperability. If we're interoperable, then I'm not just interoperable with my own satellites. I'm interoperable with everybody's satellites. And customers get a much better experience if they're not having to swap out modems, if they're not having to, to, to figure out which network they want to sign up for. If you're an airline, even today, it's incredibly confusing to try and make technology decisions when all you want to do is connect planes. And that has to be... I think our ambition as an industry. An open architecture and virtualize. It's difficult to do these things unless you have an open architecture, unless you're willing to interoperate with others. And virtualization, that problem of you know, which technology do you deploy on an aircraft goes away if those um, services are virtualized, both terrestrially in gateways, but also on aircraft or ships at sea or in terminal, so virtualization, and that links directly with cloud. So if we can bring these things together, we create much, much larger, much more scaled networks as an industry, rather than you know, what's SES doing today, or, or Intelsat, or Viasat, or Inmarsat. We bring these networks together in an intelligent and coherent way. So O3BM Power is now a reality. We launched the first two satellites at the back end of last year, and one of, one of our employees, Christina Smith-Meyer, went to the launch and she made a video, the video I'm about to play you, and she describes this as a love letter to the industry. So I'll play it for you now. 
15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And lift off of SES and power. Go Falcon 9, go SES. Lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40, carrying the O3B M Power satellites to orbit. Should never get tired of a launch. Uh, and so, O3B Empower, why do we see this as an important um, building block, key architectural building block within our network, but also our customers' networks and other operators' networks? Because we've, as we started imagining O3B Empower sort of in late 2017, we wanted to capture all of the benefits of being in medium Earth orbit, everything that we'd learned through the deployment of O3B, the incredible connectivity that we could deliver, the stable orbit, the fact that handover was seamless. We wanted to keep all of those things, but scale it ridiculously. And so make medium Earth orbit an essential layer in what we describe as a multi-orbit environment. And so what did, we, what did we want to achieve? We wanted to achieve industry best, best throughput. We wanted throughputs of tens of megabits to tens of gigabits through, into a single terminal from a single beam on the spacecraft. We wanted full digitization. We wanted thousands of beams rather than the 10 beams that we were limited to on the O3B system. The O3B system was essentially an analog system. O3B and power is fully digital. It's, it's a completely different set of technologies and that allows us to be flexible in the way we deploy services. We can stand up beams, deliver services, move those services over time, take down beams and move that capability to the other side of the planet. It's the most incredibly sophisticated digital platform and it's global from day one. But it's also predictable performance and this comes as a result of being in medium earth orbit, relatively infrequent handovers, no jitter. The, the, one of the challenges with LEO with hundreds or thousands of satellites is you're handing over services on a continuous basis and that has impact on data performance. This is infrastructure, this is carrier grade performance, MEF certified. This, we go to telcos and describe the performance of O3B and Power, they wanna, we want them to know exactly what that means and be able to integrate O3B and Power seamlessly into their systems and networks. Flexible bandwidth, this isn't just flexible in terms of where the bandwidth it's de is delivered, it's flexible in the way it's delivered over time. The performance in SLA is managed by the system itself, it's not managed by somebody on a console. And that also speaks to this idea of high availability and operating through contested environments. Some of the technologies that we've put on board O3VM Power meet or surpass some of the technologies that were launched on Milsatcom not very long ago. So we've really integrated a whole bunch of capability into this capable digital platform 
which is global the day it launches. And sovereignty and sovereign space, I know later on today, this morning there's a keynote on the relevance of space to governments and how do we use commercial sat satellite communications in a sovereign government context. And Empower is a tool that I think can be absolutely used for this. Why is that? Because we can deploy sovereign gateways, gateways which are in sovereign locations, and those gateways can operate a, a secure network across O3BM power. This is not shared capability. This is not contended capability. It's dedicated infrastructure that can be effectively combined with MILSATCOM in a seamless network operated entirely by governments and, and in a sovereign way. And government connectivity, government communications requires different things to just delivering the internet. It requires connectivity with ISR platforms, manned or unmanned. And there the challenge isn't getting data into the network, it's getting data out of the network and lots of data. And flexibility in terms of the way Empower works means we're totally flexible in terms of forward and return. We can change it on the fly and, and increase the amount of return capability that we have. Full interoperability, so we're designing O3BM power so it can be interoperable with all of our geostationary satellites. And if it can interoperate with our satellites, it can in interoperate with other satellites, including WGS, including Skynet, including Syracuse. And so our satellites, our medium Earth orbit global capability becomes an extension of government networks. Terminals on the ground can access O3BM power and a military satellite simultaneously. The frequency plans work well, the terminals work well, and obviously if we're providing services to governments, they need to be secure. 250,000 cyber attacks on Ukrainian networks in the first 10 months of the war shows that if we're part of critical infrastructure, we have to be absolutely lasered on cyber security. And so now what I'm going to talk is a little bit about what I mean by multi-orbit and where Empower fits, but also where other systems fit. This isn't a pitch for SES or for Empower. This is trying to paint a vision for how we as an industry can come together and deliver better services for our customers. And it starts with geostationary. It starts kind of where we all began delivering services from 36,000 kilometers away. The, um, we, we, we think every orbit has its merit, and it's about using the right tool to, to, to address the right problem and integrating uh, the orbits in an intelligent way. And so geostationary, you, you have this tremendous reach. As I said, the superpower of satellite is reach. And so with only three satellites, you can provide global coverage. There's a huge amount of flexibility in how you can deliver services from geostationary orbit. Obviously, one of the challenges is latency. 600 milliseconds of latency to geostationary causes problems in data networks, which is why we deployed O3B and now O3B in power into medium Earth orbit, what we consider to be the sweet spot because we've solved the latency problem, but we're not so close to the Earth that we need hundreds or thousands of satellites to start deploying services. We can deploy with as, with as few as six satellites, and then we can build the network over time. But the real magic is connecting these two networks. And so now you have geostationary satellites and medium Earth orbits, which are effectively connected by common terminals on the ground and common platforms that operate across these networks. So we launched a satellite last year called SES-17. It's a KA band satellite, high throughput satellite that sits over the Americas. And now we can seamlessly take an aircraft from Europe across to the Americas on O3BM power. And when we get to the US, we can transition seamlessly onto SES-17 using the same technology, same platforms, and the customers on board the aircraft will, will be none the wiser that they've moved from a medium Earth orbit satellite system onto a high throughput KA band geo satellite system. And that idea, I think, multiplies way beyond SES. If we can do that within our network, we can do that within others' networks as well. And so that kind of brings us up to today but what happens in the future? So in the future, from an SES standpoint, we designed O3BM power to be uh, capable to also operate in inclined planes. And so that would be the next step for us, so that we would extend the capability, our MEO capability, to inclined planes. And that means polar capability, polar coverage. That allows us to add more capabilities. We can add, you know, we won't be limited in the future to just communications. We can add more services and more missions to this incredibly strategic orbit to try and address some of those challenges that we talked about right at the start. And if we're going to do that, then we want to link the satellites together. And so 
from a single gateway that might be based in Europe or the US, you can connect with any point on the Earth without going back to the Earth. And that is, again, an important capability for sovereign networks. And this is now something that we can do that even five years ago, I would say, maybe even two years ago, was not possible and not within the realms of the things that we could achieve. And then last but not least, low Earth orbit. And again, this doesn't speak to a network that SES will necessarily build. This speaks to a network that the industry is already building. And so what we want to do is connect these orbits in an intelligent way, both in space and on the ground, and have this seamless converged network that can support the services that are going to address the challenges that we had on that first slide. And so hopefully that gives a picture for how we see our capabilities fitting into the global industry. As I said, I, I think our opportunities are huge. I think we need to combine our networks in a smart way and build scale. And if we do that, these are some of the things, these, these are the, the prizes, if you like, that we, that we have in front of us. So investment in space in 2022 alone was 20 billion. Satellite capacity market by the end of this decade will grow 10% year on year to 30 billion by the end of the decade. In-flight aero connectivity is a big, big driver. 7 billion, this is an industry that certainly 30 years, didn't, 30 years ago didn't exist. 10 years ago didn't exist. This has been generated just in the last decade. 100 countries around the world have established broadband infrastructure plans. We, we are massive participants that it's not economic to connect populations entirely terrestrially. And so we as an industry are huge beneficiaries of this need to connect people wherever they are. And 5G and cloud, the convergence of these technologies and us adopting them and embracing them in space and on the ground will be an enabler for us scaling our networks and being able to address more of these requirements. And all of that will help keep us safer, keep us safer as citizens, help us make sure that future generations are able to, to deliver services out into the future. Our job is to make sure that we're continuing to deploy into space in a responsible way, and we're as focused on space sustainability as we are protecting our planet. So you're right to be optimistic about our industry. You're right to be here this morning drinking the bad coffee and uh, very happy to be here with you this morning and participating in all of this excitement with you in our industry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for, for talking to us this morning. If you don't mind, have a seat. I just have a couple questions for you here uh, and, uh, and then we'll get to, to our panel. But, um, just wanted to ask you a couple of things. First, is that when you first announced the concept for O3VM Power a few years ago, you were talking about a lot of really exciting concepts, mm. you know, like you know, multi-orbit, you were talking about open architecture, you were talking about integrating with the cloud, and it was very exciting for the people who understood uh, satellite connectivity, the industries that were using satellite connectivity. Yep. But today, there are a lot more industries using satellite connectivity. So for the people in the audience who are brand new to this, who don't understand or don't don't really care how it works, they just want the connectivity. How do you explain in layman's terms why they should be excited about O3B and power? I think a big, a big focus for us has been uh, taking satellite mainstream, so making satellite part of broader ecosystems, cloud, mobile, and, if we, and I think with, with O3BM Power, we've done that. We, we've started down that journey, and, uh, and I think there's a long way to go. I think that, like I said, the technologies that we have available to us today are you know, leaps and bounds from the technologies that we had 10 years ago. So it's- Especially on the ground too. And yeah. particularly on the ground. And I, and I think that's where you, you have to build space architectures that can continue to benefit from technological developments on the ground. And that does speak to open architecture, not getting tied into a particular type of technology, being able to integrate with more and more networks and sort of building this scale, which I think is so important. We're a relatively fragmented industry, whether you think about the number of operators, the number of satellites, the number of different terrestrial technologies, and the fewer of those that we can have and the more integrated we become, I think our, we're holding our industry back in terms of the impact that we can have. And uh, my next question is, other than bad coffee, we have a lot of government <laughs> military attendees. And by the way, you're from Europe, the definition of bad coffee, anything American coffee is, is bad coffee. 
But um, we have a lot of government military attendees, mm. um, and you mentioned some of the, uh, the government applications in your presentation. Mm. Uh, you know, we have a keynote this afternoon from, uh, from uh, Don Graves from mm. the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, obviously, government SATCOM applications are going to be high demand with the state of the world as, yep. as in today. Uh, can you talk a little bit specifically about what, what you can offer U.S. government military? Yeah, so, I mean, we announced a couple of weeks ago um, that the Luxembourg government were making a commitment to O3B Empower, and they would effectively use the, the, the capabilities that we've developed and deliver those towards Luxembourg's partners in, in Europe, but also in NATO. And Luxembourg signed a framework agreement with the U.S. that effectively facilitates the procurement of O3B Empower and the capabilities that we have and allows that to then be positioned into sovereign U.S. government networks. And as I spoke about, this, this idea that you know, WGS and O3B Empower can operate as a seamless system, I think is, is, is really game-changing. That's an overused word, but, you know, warfighters who have a terminal uh, that's configured for WGS, and if WGS is no longer available because either higher priority users um, have taken priority or operating in a contested environment, it's not available, having access to a global system with the kind of capabilities that we have with O3B Empower, I think it's invaluable from a resilience standpoint, from a performance standpoint, and it's not one where you, in, where you have to choose. We can operate over GEO and MEO simultaneously, and that even adds further to the, the kind of resilience that we can deliver. And if you look at government, and I'm super interested to hear the presentation this, this afternoon, if you look at government, the kind of requirements that governments have speak to the sort of capabilities that we're building on Empower high throughput, dedicated, non-contended, sovereign that can be managed by the government, the government themselves, integrated with their own space-based capability, able to be delivered onto and off moving platforms, including ISR, manned and unmanned platforms, Navy, ships at sea. We've, with the O3B fleet today, we're the leading provider of cruise connectivity because we provide high bandwidth, dedicated, follow the ship capability and all of that. Directly, re directly relevant to, to Navy. So, yeah, I think the capability uh, is significant. And as I said, in, in most exciting, it, it integrates and therefore scales the networks that already exist. Well, thank you so much, Steve. You, you've got a launch coming up soon to SES 1819. Uh, when is yeah. that? That's, uh, this yeah, that's Friday. So Friday. I, get, I get to go to the, to the sun in Florida and get away from the cold here outside <laughs> and, uh, and go launch some satellites. And that, that's, that's super. I mean, two big priorities for SES this year getting our C-band um, satellites and, and networks cleared and, and collecting the $3 billion that, that we will have earned through that clearing and then getting Empower launched and starting delivering services to all these fantastic people. Thank you so much. Let's give another round of applause for SES CEO Steve Collar. We're now going to start the panel. Uh, we have a, a video for our uh, session sponsor, Viaset. So thank you so much for joining us. Stick around. We're going to start the general session in just a moment. Thank you again to our session sponsor, Viasat. 
And now, moderating the panel, U.S. Senior Director, Advanced Systems, Astroscale, Carolyn Bell. Thank you all for joining us today for this opening session on building a secure and dynamic future space economy. Today's space economy, the paradigm that we're in is individual capabilities that operate in largely single dimensional value chains. But where we're going, we are going to have a interconnected, self-sustaining ecosystem of capabilities where value flows in all directions. We think about this future space economy a lot. I'm sure that many of us have been talking about it this week at receptions, but it's not gonna happen unless we build it in a very intentional way. And that is going to be those of us in this room today. I heard this morning that around one third of the attendees of this conference are new. This is the first time that you have been here engaging in space and working with us to build that future. So I'm delighted to have you. I'm delighted to have your ideas. And to drive this conversation, we have six experts with expertise from across the industry to, to walk us through this challenge. So I am pleased to introduce uh, Richard French, uh, the uh, Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at Rocket Lab, Mike Gold, Chief Growth Officer at Redwire, Sarah Schellfeffer, the uh, Space Sector Vice President and CTO at Northrop Grumman, Robert Lightfoot, the Executive Vice President at Lockheed Martin, John Moberly, uh, Senior Vice President at Spider Oak, and finally, Lee Steinke, the Chief Operating Officer at OrbitFab, and Dual had it as the Chief Operating Officer at Cislunar Industries. So thank you all for being here today. All of them have wonderful bios, but we only have 60 minutes to uh, pull on, on their minds, so I will encourage all of you to read those on the Satellite 2023 website. And we're gonna dive into this first question about the future. So, all of you, looking 20 years or more into the future, what will the space economy look like, and how will that ecosystem diverge from what we have today? Richard? Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll be a little bit of a downer. Um, I think it'll look a lot like it does today. I, th I think that communications is still going to be dominant uh, as, the, as the revenue stream. I'm bullish about you know geospatial and general remote sensing you know being a growth area you know it's I've always been bullish about that and I, I think it'll it'll be an increasingly large part of the pie um, but I think that we're still going to be kind of pushing for the really transformational uh, capabilities um, like you know really well resourced uh, in space transportation systems or you know millions of people living and working in space i think that i think that that will still be very much an area that we're that we're pushing to develop all right thanks so i'm still dealing with jet lag so i've had three cups of coffee today so i'm going to be the optimist driven by <laughs> caffeine and I believe that we are going to see a transformation in the industry, particularly driven by microgravity research, development, and manufacturing. Uh, Redwire has been leading the way on this with both biotech and material science, but I believe that we are on the verge of new cancer treatments of organoids and eventually organs being printed in space, and that the countries and companies that excel at microgravity are going to be dominant forces, both economically and even in terms of national security. So I think that micrograv development that will be enabled in particular by commercial space stations is going to drive demand and really transform the industry, certainly over the next two decades. Sir? I think as technology advances, uh, the, what we've seen in space Will, will continue and it will continue to become more ubiquitous and allow us to ask the next uh, great questions and answer the challenges that come with them. In terms of ubiquity, I mean, a commercial LEO and um, distributed communications are gonna allow for more people to have access to come and allow real-time data flowing anywhere from anybody. The advances and uh, return to the moon and even residence on the moon is going to allow for uh, space logistics and set the stage for interplanetary travel. And 
the advances in the technologies that allow all this to happen are, are gonna enable other industries as well. But all of this is, is not gonna be possible unless we um, allow for uh, sustainable and um, sustainable operations um, as an international community that reflects how we currently operate in maritime and air. I think, I think for me that, that what I see 2043 being is just a, a continuation, like everybody's saying, of what we're doing now, but I think it's going to move faster with a sense of urgency. I believe there's going to be more terrestrial applications as, as different industries become more and more, um, more, and more dependent uh, on the space environment. I think a lot of people in this room, we, we kind of take space for granted. We're used to having it. We used to have everything we, that we have at our disposal. We did an exercise called uh, Space 2050, and our exercise was basically to see what, what do we think the future is going to be. And one of the things that I think we'll see, just to add on to what others have said, is I think that the advent of smart cities is going to be a very interesting uh, demand signal as we put things, more things up for space. So that's the one thing I would add to what others have said. Yeah, and uh, so it kind of stole uh, what I was going to say, but the uh, IC acceleration and uh, the much more ubiquitous environment, all, all of that enabled by a much broader uh, interconnectivity, uh, mesh networks. So just like a Android talks to iPhone you know, ubiquitously, uh, all the space assets will be able to securely talk, uh, communicate, uh, distribute data uh, in, into a, uh, the terrestrial systems and it'll all, all just be uh, up there and uh, really ubiquitous. So the, uh, uh, the secure connection connectivity of that is where we come into play. And that is going to be a, a, a key enabler for all of these uh, highly distributed and disaggregated systems uh, as they come together. More of a system of systems architecture, just, just like we uh, do with our, our uh, cell phones and iPhones, uh, Android uh, today. Yeah, I think we'll have an expansion of the categories of services and products that are generated in space for the benefit of Earth and for use on Earth. And I also think by 2043, we'll probably have a closed loop economy where some products and services are created, bought, sold, and consumed in space. Uh, so that's, that's where we all are, I guess. Awesome. Thank you for giving us those introductory thoughts. So, you know, a few threads that came out uh, looking at microgravity, looking at terrestrial applications, smart cities. I mean, these are potentially customers that we don't have today. Um, and they're potentially customers that we don't know who they are, that don't know what they want, that don't know that space can play a role in solving their problems. So how do we as the space industry uh, close that gap so that we can expand our own economy and address those problems that we're facing? How do we figure out the answer to that problem? Well, I, I would say we actually have those customers today, um, you know, and, and, you know, Rocket Lab's approach is to, is to provide the picks and shovels. So, you know, we are already developing systems that can support, you know, microgravity research and in-space manufacturing. Uh, you know, we have a, a multiple satellite vehicle deal with, uh, um, with Varda Space Industries, and, and they have some very exciting um, opportunities across multiple verticals. And so really honored to be, to have been trusted with their problem. Um, you know, we're working on direct to device uh, connectivity, obviously. It's very public, uh, are providing satellites to uh, Global Star. Um, uh, and, you know, anyone with an iPhone 14 can, you know, can already benefit from these services. And so, um, so yeah, I, I would say we have those, those customers already today. And so, um, uh, and, and, you know, we're there to provide the picks and shovels. Yeah, I would echo that, that right now at Redwire, we've got nine payloads currently on the International Space Station. Thank you, Northrop Grumman, for bringing many of those up. We appreciate it. Um, and we've done over 600 experiments. So we know who the customers are. I would compare Micrograv right now to where the internet was in the mid-90s, that we know the utility is going to be tremendous. We know it's going to be transformative. We just haven't quite taken that leap. And as we talk about 20 years in the future, I mean, I, 20 years, we will be manufacturing organs in space. They'll be developed from your own stem cells. You'll be able to replace livers, kidneys, hearts. And I have nothing but selfish interest because I'm going to need all of those in 20 years. <laughs> so I think it's going to be an extraordinary future that, again, will drive a lot of the needs, a lot of the launch capabilities, 
completely agree, by the way, with the lunar development. You know, by then, uh, Artemis will be fully established and moving on uh, to Mars, thanks to Orion and everything that our friends at Lockheed Martin uh, and others are doing. But I think in order to sustain that vision and achieve it, we have to be very careful about avoiding a space station gap. That this only occurs if we continue to have a presence in low Earth orbit, which is why the CLD, the Commercial Leo Destinations Program, is so important. And for all of us to ensure that we don't see low Earth orbit and the benefits of microgravity to the Chinese. So we need to continue those public-private partnerships. We need to continue to fund that so that we never give up on the legacy and incredible work that the International Space Station started, and we carry that incredible heritage into the future. So on the space station, it's an interesting point because I, you know, that's really the only example of public infrastructure um, in terms of looking at the ISS National Lab that, that we have access to in space. Economies on Earth are built, enabled by infrastructure, by roads, by trains, by the internet, right? All of these are things that are developed um, jointly with the government. So for space to develop, do we need more infrastructure? And if so, who takes the lead in setting requirements, in designing it, in paying for it? Um, Sarah, I saw you lean your head forward. Do you want yeah. to take a crack at that? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. We need more infrastructure. And I think with our mission extension vehicles and mission robotic vehicle that's going to go up next year, that's the beginning of that type of in infrastructure, the transport we provide to the, the space station. But I think to your earlier question, the most important thing is going to be um, investing in the, the next generation of the workforce and then working together everybody on this stage in this room, you know, teaming, partnerships, and, and putting our heads together to address these challenges as we go forward. Yeah, I think for the, the way I think about it, kind of combining those two questions is, you know, we've got to get space down to earth. We, we talk about things we're doing in space, and we're going to do, I mean, that's just going to continue to expand. But there's a lot of the general public and a lot of the world that doesn't understand what we do in space and what the benefit they get. Um, I, I tell a story, and, and I'll share it again, is I was, we had just shipped one of our GPS satellites, and I was speaking at a, an event like this, not space folks, but non-space folks, and I made a comment that we just shipped a, a, a GPS, and somebody said, why do I need GPS satellites anymore? I've got it on my phone. <laughs> and, and, and about half the room didn't laugh, and I went, we need to talk after I get through talking. So I think there's a, there's a, a, a piece of this process for us as we expand the capability in space, which we're going to do, everybody's talking about it, is how do we get back down to the folks on Earth here so they understand that benefit. Today we're working with several state and local officials who normally don't think about space and how it can play. Um, and then there's an initiative we have called Firefighting as a Service where we're trying to take all this data we're now collecting from all these different uh, platforms in space and, and, and creating a way to help firefighting. That's something that Everybody understands internationally, not just nationally. And how can you take that data and possibly even prevent the fire based on what you know? So it's getting all these assets that we're putting up there so that it affects the general public in a way that they understand, wow, you know, I can tell them all day long your, your banking transaction is dependent on space. It doesn't really register, right? But if I tell them I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save your home, we're going to drive your insurance rates down, things like that, that's the way we've got to take all these assets that we're putting and, and build that economy even better. Lee? Yeah, I think um, society functions okay when people don't know that milk comes from a cow, but markets <laughs> don't develop that way. And I think that infrastructure development creates the stories around which you can generate a conversation that will draw more awareness of what we're doing. And, and I see it in, in terms of the Internet. The Internet enabled so much infrastructure on, on the Earth. Well, it uh, in, in space, you know, they, they've kind of toyed this term outer net, uh, but but the the uh, uh, relay in space is different. It's, it needs to be disruption tolerant. Uh, it's a asynchronous network. It's got to be fully decentralized because space assets are all all those nodes. Satellites are just a node in, in this overall architecture uh, connected to uh, terrestrial nodes. Uh, all all of these are uh, distributed, disaggregated, and decentralized. So it, so it takes a, a different type of mindset and and network to. Uh, connect all of these pieces together. I'll add a couple of comments. So, so I, um, at the DISC conference, I think it was Gil uh, Kelmer that made a provocative comment that there really are no true commercial space companies. 
Um, and I think there's some wisdom to that. You know, the almost everything we do is a public-private partnership. And if we think about infrastructure, you know, launch infrastructure is one of those key capabilities that's unique to space. And you know, with the, the congestion of the eastern and western range, you know, Rocket Lab has been very deliberate in investing in, in launch capacity on the ground, both with our launch sites in New Zealand and on the eastern shore. We've got a launch going off tomorrow. Launch attempt number 34 going out of Virginia. So go up on the roof to check it out. Um, uh, and so, uh, but none of those capabilities, even our most commercial, you know, forward leaning capability in New, in New Zealand is FAA licensed and it took, you know, treaties between New Zealand and the United States government to enable that capability. So I think public private partnership needs to be a really important theme in all the infrastructure investment conversations. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I'll just, you know, be provocative in one area, you know, the cis lunar economy is currently constrained by the lack of large assets on the ground. You know, communications, as we all know, is critical to, to, to our business and, and the lack of having access to large assets on the ground uh, to, to enable that communications is currently, you know, stifling that growth. All right. So in terms of what infrastructure we, we need, it sounds like um, launch is an ongoing need that's being developed and you continue to advance. Uh, logistics and servicing, Sarah, you talked about having in-space mobility capabilities. Um, ground, of course, is a, is a huge piece. Um, Space stations, uh, where we don't have a gap between the ISS and the, the multiple stations that are being developed. Are there other pieces that we need to be thinking about? What else needs to be on that list before we forget? Lee. Fuel depots and metal processing. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think um, some of the things that are industrialized on Earth, we don't like to think about having those in space because it's so pure and beautiful. But in reality, as you develop a full, full economy, you're going to need all the dirty stuff that we do down here. And so um, having fuel depots, refueling opportunities, chemical supply, whether that's sourced on Earth or sourced uh, on the moon or other sources, um, as well as just processing of materials, whether it's metal, um, mining infrastructure, all those sorts of things. Yeah. I agree. The, the infill. The in-space um, assembly and manufacturing, you know, having the ability to produce and manufacture things at scale that don't have to go through the launch process is going to okay. be critical. I couldn't agree more. And we're not going to be able to do any of this without power. So please add power <laughs> to the list. Okay. Particularly as we look at the lunar surface, we talked to our friends at NASA, and I think all of us in the private sector agree, we are going to be power constrained. And we're very proud at Redwire with our rollout solar arrays that are on the ISS, powered the DART mission. We need to transition that and other technology to ensure that we've got the power to do the ISRU that I agree is so important. If we can't live off the land, we're not going to be successful. We're not going to be sustainable. I'm glad that NASA is doing the public-private partnerships with tipping points and other programs to ensure that we develop that infrastructure. And I can't help but take the bait but echo what Robert was saying about people just don't understand what we're doing in space. And really, that's on us. I think we failed for the general public to explain it. When I was at NASA, I had a BBC reporter ask me, how can you justify spending billions of dollars in space when we have existential threats on Earth like climate change? <laughs> to say we wouldn't even know about climate change if it wasn't for the incredible assets that NASA and no one others bring to it. So I hope we can all do a better job in the next 20 years of explaining what we do to the general public. Yeah, yeah Mike, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you guys about what type of responsibility do you think that we have as an industry with how critical we know our role is in the global economy to make sure that we are serving that global economy and going back to what Steve was talking about in his keynote, ubiquitous connectivity drives value across a person's entire life potentially depending on all the ways that it can be used. What do we need to do to make that better? How do we fix that problem of communication? It's an easy answer, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, so we're, we're a key enabler ourselves, and so we spend a lot of time thinking of, of how to connect all, all of the, uh, the data uh, securely and in a trusted, trusted manner. So we, we need to, uh, we're kind, kind of like the, the glue, we need to be working with everybody at this uh, 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 panel as well as er, er, just about everybody in the audience to connect all these dots uh, securely so that uh, all this uh, the synergies of interconnectivity can can really come into uh, uh, fruition. Uh, that is that is a key foundational infrastructure that you can't can't necessarily see that has to be built out. And not just interconnectivity, but interoperability. I think is going to be critical to the success of 
refueling and all of our future operations? And for your excellent question, what do we need to do as an industry? I do think commercial space needs to stand up when it comes to norms of behavior and establishing the rules of the road in space because it's not just government anymore. Many of these operations are being conducted by the private sector. So we can't just leave it to the Department of State and others to figure these things out. And when I was at NASA, I led the development of the Artemis Accords. Very grateful to your boss, Peter Beck, who helped get New Zealand on board. So I hope that we all engage with the United Nations, with Coast Bar, with various FACAs to ensure that we support interoperability because we're the ones who need to figure out what that will be and also establishing those rules of the road so that we can have a peaceful and prosperous future in space. Yeah, I think the interoperability is really important. And I think part of our job, frankly, as industry is to help kind of develop the standards for that. Mm -hmm. How do we all operate? I, I, don't, I think the days of, of us operating in stovepipes as industry is, are gone, right? I mean, I think about, I mean, we have a $400 million uh, LM Ventures that we use to, to help bring technology along, not, not because I can't do it, I don't have time to do it, and there's so many of you, think about the attendees here. Think about when you go to conferences and how many, every year you go to a conference, there's a booth somebody you hadn't heard about. Who are they? Right? How do we get them as part of this infrastructure? But the, the best way to do that is to establish the standards so that we, when they do come on board, we all kind of have, and, and I'm not talking about locking it down into, it's got to be this color, this, you know, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about how we can operate together so that you can bring it. I think everybody on this panel is working with us in some way or another. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the value uh, of, of having a standard. We have like the Aspen system we're putting in, things that have become these open system architectures that we can all play in and it leverages everybody's strengths. That's about the only way we get that from an interoperability standpoint. So the, the Aspen port, glad you brought that up because you guys have designed that to do a, a number of things. Can anyone else build a spacecraft that can be compatible with the Aspen port? Is that something that anyone can work with? That's, that was our goal. We put it on the... It's out there on the internet. You can see the standard. You design one side and they can do whatever on the yeah. other side. Yeah, that's, okay. that was the goal of it, yeah. Great. I see some challenges with interoperability um, with ITAR, right? So when you're trying to develop a technology that's supposed to be a standard, but some of it is protected, people are reinventing the wheel left and right on <laughs> things that even with our best friends <laughs> across the pond, uh, we can't use the same tools to do this, solve the same problems. And I think that's, that's going to hold us back. Uh, in terms of standardizing and interoperability. And I think there's one other hurdle as well. We have a wonderful organization that's been founded, Confers, um, and, and they're working toward interoperability and standards, but they've set it up so that everybody has to agree on the standard. Uh, it has to be a unanimous vote. And I think we can all agree that, that that's a hard hurdle to meet. And uh, giving an opportunity for uh, some sort of majority, but then for people to express dissent uh, might enable uh, a quicker path to some standards uh, that are not hurdled by, by ITAR. And, and does it need to be one standard? I mean, looking at, at this stage, right? So Sarah Lee, each of your companies make a, a refueling interface mm -hmm. um, that aren't the same. Right. Um, is it okay to have multiple capabilities out there or do we all really need to agree on just one for each thing? I, th I think it depends on what we're talking about, right? Okay. For, for, I mean, if it's a, for, for us, if it's a common interface that anybody can build, okay, no big deal. But if you're getting into specialty things of a, uh, I'll use the example NASA did. NASA, NASA when, when we were there, developed the do international docking standard, okay? So they didn't tell you how to build your vehicle. They just built this piece that's going to be the standard you have to use to dock to anything, space station, ultimately uh, the Artemis gateway, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But it's an international standard, and it's, it's again, it's out there on the web. You want you want to dock with us? You build your docking mechanism has to match. So I think it kind of depends. I don't have to go back into the rest of the other folks' systems, but at some point there's got to be a you know 1553 bus, right? There's got to be a, a common standard that that allows that interoperability. I'd like to see functionality drive standardization That's rather than. I mean, we have a USB A, B, and C for reasons, um, and I think it's fine to to expand based on the need of that in, you know, individual technology. And it's particularly important if we want to see the growth of ISAM yeah. and all of the satellite servicing concepts that many of us are working on. 
It, it can be as simple as just having a code so that we can find it interfaces so that they work. I think anything taken to an extreme can be bad so that we want to strive for interoperability, but just as Robert said, you don't need to say this has to be green, this has to be red, but enough where we can dock and refuel, refuel et cetera. And I, I can't help but echo you know, the issues on export control. I wrote three law review articles on the intersection of export control and commercial space. If anyone's having trouble falling asleep, I highly recommend them. <laughs> but we need to ensure that we're doing export control with a scalpel and not a chainsaw. Yeah. And that when it comes to information like this, that you know, we're afraid to put out standards. It isn't going to help anyone. We need to make sure that if information is already widely available in the marketplace, that we're not controlling it. Because then the only country that's being injured is America. I'll echo that kind of meat and potatoes because it's interesting. A lot of the standards conversations focus on, focuses on advanced capabilities, you know, stuff that doesn't exist yet. But actually, a lot of our business is still kind of very sticky because of, you know, just meat and potatoes issues. Yeah. So, you know, one that is an interesting observation is, you know, Triple E INST 002, which is one of the prevailing Triple E parts quality standards, is really a Goddard branch standard. You know, and yet this is a document that appears in, you know, reference in many of our of our contracts. Well, NASA is just going through a process now of making that a NASA level document, which the whole you know industry can can continue to use. But there's a very interesting enhancement underway to look at commercial parts, COTS. You know, what are the what are the best practices for using COTS in a in the radiation environment? And so, you know, standards just around triple E parts compatibility and, and use of COTS in space is a really important kind of meat and potatoes item. And so, so yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, more standards will be helpful. Um, I, I want to go back also to what you were saying about just industry leading in terms of best practices. A lot of our customers are actually insisting on a lot more um, environmentally friendly requirements that are not, you know, that are far in excess of any regulatory body, you know, very aggressive deorbit requirements, demisability, et cetera. And I think that's also very exciting where, you know, we're bringing technological solutions. And so, um, yeah, I think regulators maybe in some cases do need to be more aggressive about catching up to where government or where industry thinking is. And we must get the regulatory framework right. And I think many of you have heard me say before, the engineering is the easy part, like the politics and the finance. There's no rocket equation for getting Congress to move. And we are about now to enter into the Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty discussion for the continuing supervision of commercial space activities. The commercial Space Flight Federation just put out an op-ed yesterday. But this is the regime that's going to determine how we regulate commercial space stations, how we regulate satellite servicing, how we regulate what's going to happen on the moon commercially. And I think we've seen, particularly with export control, it can stymie an entire industry. So this, again, for your question, what does industry need to do? We must stand up and engage effectively with Congress, with other policymakers, to ensure we get a regime that is inherently safe, supports interoperability, but also creates an environment that can still be dynamic and innovative and allows U.S. companies and others to grow. Yeah. I, might I think it. one thing to uh, remember, it, 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 everything is going to be a hybrid architecture. Uh, commercial systems are not going to be the same as, as government. Uh, and so the, uh, the, um, the translator capability uh, that we personally provide but uh, uh, for hybrid space architectures, but not just hybrid space architecture, the hi hybrid command and control architectures to allow commercial allied uh, uh, and, and government uh, to all, all command and control uh, satellites can, uh, uh, securely, the, uh, the ability to uh, interoperate between uh, allied commercial and U.S. government, uh, uh, you know, every, allied by design is uh, to, uh, to bring in ally, allies first, but they haven't figured out how to uh, uh, securely uh, um, merge, merge that data. So uh, uh, even, even space main awareness, space situation awareness, all, all of those capabilities uh, we need to use everything that's out there. And so bringing back all of those heterogeneous systems uh, is, is another form of standardization that doesn't rely on standardization. Standardization data fusion is something I dream about happening as the, the apex. Um, so, so Sarah, Richard, both of you have brought up independently the question of, you know, people thinking more about the environment, whether that's during reentry, the terrestrial environment, or in space, you said uh, the space sustainability phrase. So, we see the space um, environment continue to evolve. We have more satellites launched every year than there have been before, which is really exciting. We want the economy to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So how do we balance that 
desire to, to grow what we can do in the space economy with not increasing the risk of damage to that environment and reducing our eventual ability to use it. And also keeping in mind making access to space equitable for people who maybe weren't there as early as those of us in the US. How do, how do we balance those challenges? Well, Sarah. Yeah, I, I think um, the increasing economic viability of space is making it more accessible to, to more, to more companies, more people. I mean, there's gonna be lunch on an orbital outpost. We're gonna be able to ship things to Australia in two hours. I mean, that's all coming. I think you know the, the premise of the mission extension vehicle was to extend the life so that you know it extends the business plans and, and viability and, and reduces the number of launches long term. Mm -hmm. I, I think as you as we migrate to the robotic capability, being able to reuse components that are on satellites in the graveyard, being able to move satellites around and you know not use fuel, um, be able to the, having the refueling economy. That, that all is important to how it's going to continue to evolve. Being able to mine things on you know, now asteroids and the moon, like being able to take materials and use them in different ways that we can't even conceive of right now by, by having those capabilities on orbit or beyond orbit. You asked a couple of questions. One, one about equi uh, you know, economic kind of equitability and, uh, and then generally about you know the proliferation of satellites and 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 the environment um so uh, you know a couple of provocative thoughts along both of those lines um you know if, if the answer to your question is thousands of satellites it's possible you've asked the wrong question <laughs> um how many systems of multiple thousands of satellites can the space environment support i don't think we know i, I think there's you know a lot of great analysis proceeding and i think that regulatory um, bodies need to look more seriously at the science they need to commission the science they need to study it more um, you know there can't just be opinions about kessler syndrome and, and and kind of you know political debate there needs to be real engineering and and, and analysis behind it carrying capacity figure out what that is that, that, that's right yeah and, and then and then there might be some tough choices to make um, and there's some there's some uh, coupling there, of course, with the economic equitability. Um, you know, when the answer is thousands of satellites, then the capital requirements are huge, and so that really reduces barriers to entry. And so um, I think we need to think very seriously about about how those things work together, and you know, um, and how you know what kind of authorizations are provided, and what and and potentially what sort of authorizations need to be revisited. From a, looking at each of your companies, how are you building sustainability into that for the future, right? There's both the, you know, short-term activities we take and then the long-term plans that we're implementing. Um, there's costs and benefits to both that we need to balance. And then especially for those of you that are or have recently gone public um, and have quarterly earnings to hit, how does that impact how you think about running your business? I think where some see challenges, we see opportunities that as we look at the debris issue, which is quite serious, as we all acknowledge that this is an existential threat, really, to not just new entrants, but the surviving and thriving of the space industry. Uh, I think the space-based robotics and our ability to conduct ADR missions, et cetera, Astroscale, of course, is doing some wonderful things in the area, is going to be critical. So I think there's actually a terrific synergy to where we want to go in terms of business opportunities with space-based robotics, with systems like the MEV at Redwire, we're developing robotics overseas and here that will hopefully help clean up the space environment, that these two aren't in conflict, that we actually can create entrepreneurial solutions that can help resolve the environmental issue, ensure that space remains free and open to everyone while actually adding to our bottom line and supporting what we do on a quarterly basis. That being said, it would be nice for government to step up because in the end, someone has to pay for the orbital debris mitigation. And that needs to be an effort by the governments. I hope that we see more support from NASA, more support from governments around the world. Japan has started to take this on. The UK has started to take this on. So we really need a global initiative to provide the funding that will encourage the entrepreneurialism that will lead to a safe and prosperous future for all of us. Yeah, you, you bring up funding. I think that's an important thing to think about when you're thinking about sustainability. There are different ways to interpret that word. 
and um, driving the value of your individual assets up um, means building efficiencies that can include sustainability, right? So whether it's refueling or recycling or energy, you know, more efficient energy conversion, uh, more efficient energy use and collection, um, those are things that are going to drive the cost of the whole system down and create opportunity to develop better systems, right? You make a bunch of money on efficient refrigerators, you have more money than to invest in better technology on your next refrigerator. Uh, and I think we can apply those lessons in the space industry. Yeah, I think the clarification around when we talk about sustainability, what does that mean? Because there's, a, there's an orbital debris uh, keep protecting the environment of space, and we, we factor that into we follow all the regulations that are out there today. I mean, you asked what we're doing the company. As we do that, I think all of us do that. That's one piece of sustainability. The other piece of sustainability is can this economy survive, right? Or we create, that's another sustainability. And then there's a sustainability somewhat around the, that you could call resilience. Are the systems we're putting in place sustainable against an orbital debris issue so that I'm multi, multi orbit regimes, I'm passing data so I don't lose everything? So, so I think sustainability, space sustainability to me has become somewhat of a, of a uh, systems engineering. You can put a lot of stuff in there, yeah. and there's a lot of pieces of it. And I think so we have to be very clear when we're talking, especially to policymakers, yep. about what part of sustainability are we talking about from that standpoint. Because I think people hear it differently. At least that's when we did our 2050 event, we got a lot of feedback about, hey, the technology is moving really fast. Everybody's working with a real, real sense of urgency from um, a technology perspective, but is the policy coming with us? Are they working with a sense of urgency to keep up? And so when we talked about 2050, I said, we're not worried about the technology and what the capabilities will be, but we're worried is the, is the rest of the folks coming along. And again, it can't be heavy handed. It's got to be that balance. We're, Lee and I were talking earlier. Policy often becomes regulation. Right? It's almost the, the instant answer. If you've got policy, you can have regulation. I don't think you need, necessarily need regulation. You may need a policy, but it doesn't lead straight to somebody writing a regulation around it. So there's a balance in there that we're going to have to strike. You know, on, on space congestion, uh, you know, space is obviously immense. We, we can, uh, as long as things are orche well orchestrated, we can sustain a lot of capability. Uh, and so the, and this is not my analogy, but uh, a friend of mine, the, uh, as long as everything's moving like the, uh, the Ohio State marching band uh, on the field and not, uh, and I'm a, a grad of Stanford, but not the Stanford <laughs> marching band, then, then you are, you're going to be able to uh, uh, have a highly orchestrated and, and uh, seamless uh, capability. So then it, then it becomes the, the debris management, which is where you guys and uh, Astroscale can, and others come in. But, uh, you know, and, and you can, you, there are certain pieces. You don't have to get every piece of debris. There's uh, certain orbital regimes, certain uh, debris fields, uh, certain, like, dead rocket bodies. Uh, uh, and so there's uh, that, that all that part of the sustainability, uh, all, all in it all. If with us, it always comes back to orchestration. Yeah. We've got to make sure the astronomers have has the same yeah. problems yeah. as that discussion uh, with having a single source of, of decision making for how we're going to orchestrate that. It's really interesting. And it's ultimately a global issue. If yeah. it's yeah. something yeah. that we inherently can't handle alone as the U.S. As we look at you know the anti-missile testing, anti-satellite testing, et cetera, this is where we need policymakers to ensure that we're bringing China to the table and other bad actors because we can't do this ourselves as a nation. The ITU is a wonderful yeah. example of the yeah. world getting together on this. We need to create more systems like that, mm -hmm. I think, to create a future where, again, we can survive and thrive. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to make sure that we get some audience questions in. So there are a few microphones uh, that are distributed between tables. So if you do have a question, um, please make your way back there. I think they're about midway back um, through the room, and uh, we'll be happy to, to touch on that. Uh, you know, another piece that we haven't talked about much is the shape of companies that are going to be active in space. Um, so we have seen a recent, an, another, it's not a new one, but a, a recent wave of consolidation in the industry. Um, a couple of you have been a very active part of that. Uh, and we see a lot of innovation, though, coming from small companies. But the struggle seems to be that they need to have scale to operate successfully. So how do we make sure that we have those small, nimble, innovative companies who are able to bring their products to market, uh, you know, without having to be integrated into a larger company. What, what do you see as the future makeup of the space economy, I guess, is what I'm asking. 
I think there's just going to be a lot more partnerships and a lot more teaming required to be successful. Okay. Yeah, I think we're that, and that's the way we're looking at it. As I said earlier, I think the, the our, our ability, you know, as as one of the larger companies, is is we can we can do the work, but we we and we can scale. So our goal is to help nurture these folks. We're we're not trying to buy. That's what we use our ventures fund for. Is how can we how can we help participate, help them gain, and then in some ways, it's not a mentor project today, but how do we help them get to scale? Because I'm going to need them. If I'm, if I'm bringing them in early, I'm going to need them longer term as well. So I think, I think Sarah said it perfectly. It's a lot of partnerships and a lot of teaming um, that allows them to, to, to keep that innovative, agile spirit that I see from a lot, of the, a lot of the folks we're working with, but also recognize eventually they're probably going to become a program or record and those kind of things tend to lock down the innovation and the spirit of entrepreneurship sometimes, right, as we get there. So I think that partnering is going to be important. Don't let them lose their secret sauce. Yeah, I, 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 I echo, echo those sentiments on, on partnership. I'll just offer a couple additional thoughts. I mean, first of all, I, I think, you know, the United States, uh, uh, you know, in the long run has the right model. You know, I mean, we, I'm not concerned at all about there being a, a deficit of entrepreneurs in this country you know, wanting to form businesses and solve hard problems. You know, our, our way of life, our, our economic system, it, it generates that. Uh, you know, even with the, you know, Silicon Valley Bank issue and the, you know, a lot of the reduction in, in VC going into space uh, right now, I mean, we have to be optimistic and confident that our, our system will continue to produce, you know, small businesses. And I think Biden even talked about this in the State of the Union. So I think it's really, uh, really an exciting thing. Um, you know, Buying American, I think, is important. Um, you know, uh, um, allied partnerships is also very important. And so I think there's kind of a tiered structure when we think about our buying and our behaviors in our programs and our programs of record and our own businesses that, we're, that, that we, we need to value more than, than, than just the, the economics. There's a lot of intangibles that we need to be valuing in our, in, in our supply chains and, and who we partner with. I think Thanks. space is inherently a team sport, <laughs> and I think the big primes don't get the credit that they deserve for creating an ecosystem. You know, I'd like to thank, and we've been a beneficiary of Lockheed Martin on the Orion and the camera products that we've developed, and have returned some wonderful selfies of the Orion. Uh, Boeing, our rollout solar array product came from, you know, the work with that. So I think the primes have done a great job of creating that environment, Northrop delivering the cargo. Um, I think that we need to have the government continue, though, as a customer and a catalyst, that much of what we see as the commercial space revolution was brought about by programs like COTS, CRS, now CLIPS, Commercial Crew. So I hope that the government continue to be the, the tender to keep that going. And in terms of the companies, I think diversification is key. That you, know, you don't want to be stuck in one product, one field. You know, certainly Redwire is an example of that. We've got a lot of different products, like solar sails, solar rays, cameras. Microgravity research, I think Rocket Lab has gone in that direction as well, so as we look at survival. But that's the very scale. You yeah. used to be many smaller companies that now, with scale, you're able to do a lot more. So yeah. what does that do for the next stage of companies that want to be small? Our appetite for acquisition is not sated, and so the next, uh, you know, the next innovative small company that, that's ready to take that next scaling step, I mean, this is just the natural evolution of business, so I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, and again, I kind of point to the engine of innovation that we, we see in this country, and, and it'll just continue to produce uh, you know, great results. Yeah, it's a healthy one. We've yeah, got think, big yeah. primes down for it. Yeah, I think, I think the other piece I would say is you can flip the narrative, too. And, and what I mean by that is a lot of the new entrants, a lot of the startups could use capability I have. Why do I have to be the prime? Right? I'm, se I'm selling so solar arrays today to Terran Orbital. So, and, and we've got a great agreement with Mark Bell and his team there. We've been... We've been, they're, they're a strategic partner for us on a lot of the systems we're building. Now they're coming back to us and saying, hey, I don't have to develop this. You guys have been doing it for 40 years. We'll do it. Oh, and it all right. Works. Well, you guys heard it here. Small companies, <laughs> your new subcontractor is going to be Lockheed Martin. Um, all right. We, we don't have a lot of time, so we have one question. It looks like over here. I see a spotlight. Hi. Um, so I wasn't going to bring up the Silicon Valley Bank uh, question, but Richard, you opened up that can of worms, so I think it's fair game at this point. Um, just curious as to what the panelists think might be a long-term impact of this. Obviously, the companies that were directly affected are going to be able to withdraw, uh, access their money. But I'm just curious as to whether anybody thinks 
that there could be a long-term or short-term depressing effect on the ecosystem that you're trying to create here? I, I think that um, money is, al is already, as you just heard in this recent conversation, money is already one of the key problems in advancing the technologies that are required to get to this future that we're talking about. Um, and this is, you know, the SVB crisis over the weekend is just one, um, one additional weight on our shoulders of what, what do we have to worry about in terms of getting the funding that we need to extend our lives long enough to put these technologies into practice in this community. Um, so I don't know that it's, I don't think it's the straw that broke the camel's back, I guess is what I would say about it. Um, but it is another burden uh, for smaller companies as well as the, the larger companies and the government support, um, the supporters that, that we get across the board. Um, yeah, money's, money's the, the key problem. Yeah, we are a startup. Uh, we have no exposure to uh, SVB, but um, the, there's already been a, uh, a tightening of the market. It was a, uh, you know, everybody is seeing the, the, the need for uh, secure data transport and and uh, it, but it was still a, uh, a challenge to get our uh, fundraise that we completed in January. So the uh, the tightening of the market is uh, it, it's more of a symptom than than uh, a cause. Um, you know the all the inflationary problems, that, a lot of other things uh, go into that. But it, it'll rebound. Uh, I'm confident of that too. Yeah, on our end is one that takes advantage of those capabilities a lot. It just goes into our risk calculus, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and our goal is to try to not be so risk averse. Oh my gosh, look what happened. And that's a partner for us. So we, we're actually having conversations about how do we, everybody remain calm. It's okay. We're going to, we're going to, yeah. we're still going to use those capabilities because we need them and they're part of the mission solution we're trying to provide to the customers. Thanks. All right. It looks like we have one more question. Let me just yeah. add a, a quick comment on that. I mean, the, you know, we have to have confidence in the banking system, right? And so we probably shouldn't occur, encourage any more bank runs. And so I think as leaders, we need to, you know, emphasize yeah. that with our, our our partners and teammates, and and not not uh, not cause panic. Um, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this this situation is is analyzed over time. But I mean, we've always had a very strong emphasis on on the financial um, risks of our customers. And so I think anyone that's forming a partnership you know, a customer relationship, a vendor relationship, uh, whatever, um, you know, is assessing that, that financial risk. And, and that was true before uh, this, this, you know, bank crisis, which hopefully is behind us. Uh, but yeah, I think it brings more attention to, to the need to do that. Hi, how you doing? Uh, Will Thraff from New Waves RF Solutions. We're a small company out of Ohio, um, and we do RF mill aero solutions. And we keep hearing, you know, entry into the market, you need heritage. You know, how do you get heritage in the space market if you haven't, you know, flown in space? Right. Well, so uh, getting space heritage for, for our, our software has been a uh, uh, bit of a challenge because uh, we go on to the, uh, the flight computer at very low risk. We've, we've already proven it out in uh, space qualified hardware, um, but uh, it tends to be... Um, something that that uh, people want to uh, evaluate to the nth degree before they uh, put it on. So we, yeah, we're, uh, we are dealing with that. We have a lot of supporters though with, uh, um, you know, some of the big primes as well as uh, some of the commercial operators that uh, are moving forward to, uh, to give us space heritage. So that's our, our take. Yeah, I mean, partnership's a great way, uh, you know, like Robert and others have suggested, you know, working with, with established organizations. Um, I think as Mike has suggested, you know, the uh, government is a catalyst for, for, for TRL uh, advancement. Um, and I was just actually thinking about Orbit Fab and, you know, in 2017, um, you know, Dan got into our, our startup accelerator, Techstars uh, Startup Space Accelerator. You know, five years later, they've got fueling ports and tons of programs and uh, with, with three letter agencies and it's, it's just fantastic. And so I think the, I think the uh, government played a key role in, in accelerating that. But there was also, you know, programs like, like the Techstar Starter Space Accelerator that were also very useful. So I think there's a huge amount of opportunities to, to do that. 
Question from this side. Sure. Hey there. Good morning. My name is Gan Healy from Dadless Space Technologies. We upgrade satellites post-launch with uh, various capabilities. I have a question about uh, the evolution of startup business models, right? Uh, we're a maturing industry. We often default to baseline, back-to-basic business models like hardware sales. How do you see the steps required for us to be able to move to services as an industry or some of the more you know, innovative business model elements in terms of pricing and flexibility and that sort of thing? I mean, my advice is to focus on what you're good at. Um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to buy things and you know, whether it's some, you know, components, full buses, launch, et cetera. I think a lot of companies um, you know, try to take the vertical integration approach and end up working on the wrong problem. Um, I, you know, on the other hand, you know, talking out of both sides of my mouth, you know, we do think vertical integration is a really important part of our narrative to bring lowest total cost of ownership to customers. Um, so I think that's a key kind of architectural decision that you need to make. But yeah, I'd focus on what you're good at. Business fundamentals don't change. So if you want to change the demand uh, scenario for what you're doing, then make sure it's what the market wants. Yeah, and I think you'll find a lot of people always happy to talk about their pain points. We love to complain in the industry. And if you talk to companies, whether it's large or even medium or smaller through the food chain, you'll hear what we're struggling with. And to the extent you can come in and solve problems where we either have a lack of technology, a technology that's not working, or a technology that's too expensive, that's where we'd love to come in with entrepreneurialism, new energy, new money, try to solve the problems, make the entire system work better. That's one of the big values of events like this. We get to get together and uh, listen to each other complain. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to close up here with a, a bit of a lightning round. So I want just a couple words from each of you guys. Uh, what is the biggest challenge or orbit block to changing how we operate in space? Lee, we're going to start on that end. Time, money. There was one other. I don't know. <laughs> Time and money. John. Uh, well, uh, so the satellite, the, the bus is a uh, really a commodity. Most payloads are really commodity. The, the magic's all in the algorithms, the, uh, uh, the data science and the security uh, for the most part now. And so that, that needs to kind of flip. Uh, how we how we acquire and procure uh, satellites, uh, especially on the government side. Uh, uh, the the bus as a as a prime is a, uh, a old outdated concept. Thanks, John. Let's see speed, resiliency, uh, and interoperability. Okay. Uh, building partnerships and establishing norms of behavior and operation. I'll echo that with good regulatory policy. All right, Richard. Staff, it's all about the team and executing. Okay, sounds good. So we talked a lot about terrestrial markets being where the value is going to be. Which of those terrestrial markets do you think has the most untapped potential for space to be the value driver? Not just for space to generate revenue, but for space to be that value driver that we don't have yet. Richard, we'll start with you this time. I'm, I continue to be bullish about geospatial. I think finding a way to, to, to create information products that, that can scale across all verticals. Um, uh, to me, that's, the, that's the, the, going to be a bright spot. Okay. Pharmaceutical biotech. We've already seen the ways that if you can create a perfect crystal in space, you bring that down, put it in the bat, you've got an entirely new or better treatment for everything from cancer to AIDS to COVID. I think we can have a substantial impact on that industry, not only generating revenue, but you know, creating a, a lot of health and goodness for everyone here on Earth. Great, Sarah. I would agree in health research, you know, tissue engineering, the ability to manufacture ultra pure optics, crystalline materials. Agriculture, insurance, and global logistics. Okay. Uh, I, I also like the, the pharmaceutical uh, capabilities that can be done in, in uh, microgravity, as well as the, uh, the in the longer term, the HE3 mining on the lunar surface. Not untapped, but defense. Okay. And our, our closing question today, what is one thing that your company will do in the next year to build this future space economy of 20 years from now? We'll deliver our first satellite for an external customer um, uh, and, and launch uh, and return their finished products to Earth. 
We just got our biofabrication facility, which prints human and animal tissue on the International Space Station. We're hoping that if all goes well, we'll be printing a meniscus this year. And Lord knows I could use one. <laughs> Uh, continue to invest in uh, critical assets. So the workforce, workforce development, STEM education, the factories of the future and the infrastructure to build the, the capabilities of the future and then the innovation, investing in innovation in these partnerships we've been talking about, about imagining what the, the next steps are. Uh, we're gonna deliver three prototypes through our Ignite organization, which is our innovation arm um, that we funded through our own IRAD and that's gonna be the future for where we're headed. Right. We're gonna continue to prove out and demonstrate the, uh, the hybrid space architecture of commercial government uh, allies and, uh, and civil all uh, interoperability, uh, as well as the uh, ability to uh, or orchestrate a, a battle management uh, and command control uh, concept uh, on orbit. We're going to continue to develop enabling technologies for the space economy and communicate about how those increase the value per asset of what we're doing. Wonderful. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists and all of the ideas that they have given us today. I hope you use the rest of your time at the conference to discuss those amongst yourselves. And just please join me in saying thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, the first moderator in history to successfully host a uh, lightning round in the space and satellite industry. <laughs> Three questions in five minutes has got to be a record. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our panelists. Uh, thanks to our opening keynote, Steve Collar. Uh, thank you for being with us here this morning. Thank you to our session sponsor, Viasat. Uh, we invite you to enjoy today's programming as well as our exhibit hall, which is now open. If you have a conference level badge, you can join us right here at 12 p.m. for the awards luncheon, which kicks off with a keynote from U.S. Department of Commerce Deputy Secretary Don Graves followed by the reveal of our winners from Startup Space, as well as via Satellite, Satellite Executive of the Year and Satellite Technology of the Year. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you here at 12 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody.